whether you like vegetables or not, I'm sure you would have seen all these in the market at some point or at your home. When you cut them open, this is what they look like. Do you notice these specific patterns? Have you ever wondered what they are? Um, I'll show you a better uh, pattern this way. So this is a celery stick. When you cut through celery sticks, this is what it looks like. So what are these patterns? Turns out they are used for the transport of water and minerals in these plants. In the realm of plant tissues, what you just saw is vascular tissue, which is used for the transport within the plant. So we can say they are somewhat like the circulatory system within these plants. So in this video, we are finally going to talk about the transport system in plants, which we know as xylem and phloem. We have already seen the epidermal and the ground tissue systems, right? How are vascular tissues arranged within these two systems? Let's have a look. So this is a root tip. And when you section a root tip, this is what it looks like. Starting from the outermost section, we have the epidermis, which is part of your epidermal tissue system. Epidermis is like the skin of a plant and it is the first line of defense against the external world. Next, we have cortex, uh, which is like the filler tissue. These are the connective tissues of the plant, so to say, and we learned them in the ground tissue systems video. Within the cortex, we have one more protective layer called as the endodermis. Within the endodermis is where the vascular tissues are usually located and that is why endodermis serves as the protective layer. So we have xylem and then the phloem in between. And we have one more uh, filler tissue called as the pith, which is right at the center of the structure. And we also have one more layer of cells called as pericycle. Pericycle is involved in a lateral root formation. We learned about lateral roots uh, when we learned about the structure of a root. All the structures within the endodermis together is termed as the steel. Now, the cross sections across plants, so whether it is the root of a monocot or a dicot or the stem of a monocot or a dicot, you don't see the same pattern that gets repeated. Uh, they're all very different. Why is the pattern within the steel different? The answer is quite simple. It is because of the difference in arrangement of the vascular bundles within the steel. Vascular bundle is nothing but the xylem and phloem. Uh, in some cases, we also have a tissue called a scambium. Uh, this is present only in case of dicots. There are two specific arrangements of vascular bundles, one called as radial and the other is conjoined. In radial arrangement, you see an ordinate pattern of arrangement between xylem and phloem. The yellow here is the xylem and the orange here is the phloem. In case of conjoint, they are jointed together. So the bottom is xylem and the top is phloem. In dicots, the cambium is found in between the xylem and phloem. So when there is no cambium, it's called as a closed uh, arrangement, whereas uh, when cambium is present, it is called as an open arrangement. This differentiation is based upon the position of xylem and phloem. Let's try to summarize what we saw till now. So we have the monocots and dicots, and we are comparing them across the root and the stem. In the root, both these show radial arrangement, whereas in the stem, they show a conjoint arrangement. Uh, monocots are closed systems because they don't have cambium, whereas dicots are open systems. So you remember the pictures we saw earlier. So this is the xylem followed by phloem, and here again we have xylem and the phloem. We can see the cambial tissue in between the xylem and phloem. In case of the stems, this is the xylem and we have a phloem. This is xylem, phloem with the cambial tissue present in between. Now let's talk about xylem and phloem. So xylem is for the transport of water and minerals and phloem is for the transport of food produced through photosynthesis. The transport uh, in plants has a specific name called translocation. So it's a translocation of water and minerals and translocation of food. Xylem runs from the root to the leaves. So if we have a plant and this is the root system, this is how the xylem runs. Uh, it takes the water to the leaves because that's where photosynthesis occurs. Now, in case of phloem, it takes the food from the leaves to all the other parts, including the root. So this is what it would look like. What we observe here is that the translocation in xylem is unidirectional, while the translocation in phloem is bidirectional. Xylem and phloem also have specific components within them. Because these are complex tissues, meaning there is more than one type of cell present within the tissue. We have tracheids, vessel elements, xylem fibers, and xylem parenchyma in case of xylem. And phloem has sieve tubes, companion cells, phloem fibers, and phloem parenchyma. Do you see the words fiber and parenchyma? Does it ring a bell? If you recall, fibers and parenchyma are part of the ground tissue systems in plants. Therefore, we can conclude that in addition to translocation of substances, xylem and phloem also provide mechanical strength to the plant. Let's talk about xylem first. 
triquets were the first water conducting systems that evolved. Um, you can think of them as narrow pipes with really thick walls. And these are elongated cells. And you can see that their ends are uh, tapering. Now, in order to provide maximum space for transport of water, these cells have gotten rid of their protoplasm. And therefore, these are dead cells. The individual tracheids are arranged one above the other. And there are small openings called pits that connect these tracheids. Water can flow through them, but then they have to squeeze through these pits. Next, we have the vessel elements. Vessel elements are like the upgrades that the tracheids got. Imagine you have a series of uh, garden hose and you are connecting them together. But to make it more efficient, you remove the connection portion. So it looks like a one single a huge garden hose. Now, that is vessel elements for you. So from the outside, they do look like um, individual cells that are stacked one on top of each other. When you look on the inside, we can see that the connecting horizontal plates have been removed. So this makes for a more efficient water transport system. Now, why does the plant have two uh, cells which do almost the same function? Because it's more efficient to have two systems which do the same function rather than one because one can compensate for the other in case of structural issues. And the other is an adaptation. So depending upon the climate and what the plant is going through, they can depend on uh, one type of element or the other. So for example, when the plant is in the growing phase and it wants to grow out new leaves, let's say, it depends more on the vessel elements because they provide ready flow of water. Um, but once there is a summer or autumn and there is not enough water supply, it relies more on tracheids because tracheids can hold water more efficiently within them than vessels. Both these cells do not have protoplasm and are dead cells. Let's move on to phloem. The C tubes are living tissue. They are the principal conducting cells within phloem. They are also elongated, but they have thin walls. And uh, when these cells reach maturity, they get rid of only their nucleus. When you see the inside of a sieve tube, um, these cells are again arranged one above the other. And they are connected by these perforated plate-like structures, which are called as sieve plates. You can see that there are pits on the sieve plates as well as on the walls of the sieve tubes. The most important thing about the sieve tube is that it does not have a nucleus. It has a very thin lining of the cytoplasm, uh, which is continuous between these cells arranged one above the other. And each cell also has a central vacuole. So without the nucleus and the organelles, it's difficult for the sieve tubes to make proteins of its own, regulate its metabolism, because remember, these are living cells, right? So to help them, we have one more cells which are associated with the sieve tubes called as the companion cells. Companion cells are the control systems for the sieve tubes. Um, they are elongated cells and they have a central nucleus and they are connected to the uh, sieve tubes through small pits or openings that are found on their walls. So the sieve tubes are here purely for transport, whereas the companion cells are handling how the transport is taking place. What a brilliant way to uh, specialize these cells and make them work together. Let's come back to the question of cambium. Why is cambium present only in uh, dicots and not in monocots? So you can see ca uh, cambium in woody plants, actually. Cambium is responsible for secondary growth and monocots do not undergo secondary growth. Uh, plants have two phases of growth, primary and secondary. Primary is when it grows in height. Secondary is when it grows in width. Secondary growth leads to some beautiful structures like these. These are the rings you observe in the trunk when you chop down a tree. So how exactly does the secondary growth happen? So let's imagine this is a wedge we are taken out of a tree. So when the tree is very young, it has a primary xylem. Primary structures are the ones which were formed initially or during the primary growth. Um, we have primary phloem as well. And this is the cambial layer that is present in between. During secondary growth, the primary xylem and phloem has been pushed apart because new layers have come up. This is the secondary xylem and this is the secondary phloem. As these layers expand, they grow over the primary structures. This kind of growth strengthens the plants and it helps with the overall stability of it. And we see them only in dicots. If you take a section of a monocot stem, this is what it looks like. You can't have secondary growth in monocots because the vascular bundles are all over the place. How is it possible to place a uniform layer of cambium when the structures are all scattered? So because of the scattered vascular bundles, there is no secondary growth possible in case of monocots. Now, is that a bad thing? Actually, it's not because monocots and dicots follow two different uh, growth strategies. For monocots, it's fast and flexible. Whereas for dicots, it is slow and sturdy. When you cut grass, it grows back quite fast. You notice, so grass is a monocot. 
whereas um, trees they invest in more permanent woody structures so then how do we explain the outer woody bark of a monocot like coconut a really good observation so here it's not that they have a secondary growth the bark is produced by the thickening of the already existing tissues 